A certain German once said... Dutch tough England. And a certain Frenchman said... A nation of shopkeepers. And an Italian added... In England, there are 60 different religions and only one source. And finally, an Englishman. This fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. This happy breed of men. This little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happy lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. There you have it, soldier from the States, four views of England. What will you have, soldier? Well, uh, I take a beer, but in England, the beer is warm. They like it that way. They drive to the left. An English custom. Their coffee. Yes? Well, it ain't coffee. I admire your restraint. Of course, our tea isn't tea. Uh, granted. I'll tell you another thing. Confidentially, this place is lousy with tradition. I see, like Westminster Abbey? That's a ticket. Or the Tower of London? Uh-huh. Or Magna Carta? Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, better leave Magna Carta alone. I see. You're, you're a scholar. Ah, plumber's helper. Sure, that's what I was. Did you ever hear of the plumber's code? Well, section 26 is the Magna Carta of the plumbing business. Let me say it to you. Not now, uh, soldier. I'm going to tell you something of the first Magna Carta. Is that so? Ain't you going to wear fancy clothes? Not even a ruffle. Oh, will you tell it like in the moon pictures? Gadzooks and forsooth and stuff like that? Not if I want to get paid, I won't. Just sit back and listen, soldier. For no matter your name and accent or where your father was born, in a sense, England is your ancestral home. This is your tongue and this your habit and your beginning. You and I, soldier, we came this way. The NBC University of the Air presents We Came This Way, a new historical series for home and overseas. With John W. Vandercook as the narrator, we present Chapter One, a story of Magna Carta in We Came This Way. On the outermost verge of Europe, sundered from the mainland by the running Channel Sea, float the islands of Britain. There was a time once, perhaps in the year 2000, before the Christian era, when Britain was a part of the continent and the Thames was tributary to the River Rhine. The land lay naked and frost-bitten under the polar ice cap until there came a melting of snows and a rising of seas, which inundated the shallows of Dover. And perhaps in the year 700 before Christ, there came upon Britain a second inundation, an inundation of men, fair of hair and big of bone. The Celts. And the Celts remained as conquerors over the primitive inhabitants until they too in the first century of the modern era yielded before... The Romans. In the angry, tumultuous years that followed, the invader continued to come. Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Frisians, Vikings... The Norsemen and the Danes. And 1066, the Normans under William the Conqueror. Thus an Englishman, a complex of races, an amalgam, a melting, a fusion, and yet also a breed apart. It was this blending of Gaelic-speaking, Anglo-Saxon-speaking, French-speaking people who in the reign of King John planted a seed of liberty which men call Magna Carta. Some men stumbled into evil. Some are forced into evil unwillingly. Some have a talent for it. In the year of our Lord, 1203, the throne of England was occupied by a man with a talent for evil. It may be said with truth that he was the worst king in the history of England. Therefore, John, a man of genius. Now it happened that many nobles looked upon John as usurper. For young Arthur, the son of John's elder brother, was still alive. And this became a cause for brooding and discontent until in the month of April of the year 1203, Arthur fell prisoner to John and was seized and laid in a dungeon. Who 
Who is it? Who's there? What do you want? King John. Uncle John, is it you? In the name of God, light a candle. Let me see your face. No candles, Arthur. Oh, it is you, John. A candle, sire. Nephew. Yes? What is it? Your candle is out. John, no. No, please. Not a dagger. Not while I'm unarmed. Merciful Father, I'm unarmed. Uncle, uncle. If the nobles knew, they held their tongues, for John was absolute ruler over England. Besides, there was greater cause for murmuring in the next few years, for the French possessions of the crown fell to Philip Augustus, Normandy, Anjou, Poitou, fallen and forever lost to England, while John raged and the people grew witness under the burden of his taxes. I have salt to sell. I have fine salt, good wife. Indeed it is, Chapman. And the herring? Uh, taken from the North Sea before Michaelmas a week. <laughs> Take it, good wife. It's cheap. I haven't even the half of a farthing, good sir. Uh, taxes? Taxes. Uh, good wife, can you tell me what's come over England? Haven't you heard, sir? John's come over us. Like a plague and a corruption. Curse his name. Amen, good sir. But careful. Huh? The king's man watches. I have fish to sell. I have corn to sell. I have salt to sell. It's Walter. That's an uncommon surly face you wear this morning. Your Majesty should go among his subjects more. He will see it's not so uncommon. A surly face and a surly tongue, I see. Someday, sire, more than tongues will speak. It's Walter, my friend. Your speech exceeds discretion. My monarch is not noted for his discretion. <laughs> I like a good retort. So you've heard about the wench. Which one, Your Majesty? Which one? You speak like the queen. <laughs> I speak like myself, sire. Then you speak too bold, Fitzwalter. Even a king may be too bold, your majesty. Truly? How, my friend? You have taxed each baron for the hire of mercenary soldiers. So I did. There are no mercenary soldiers. Come to think of it, you're quite right. The barons wish the return of their money, your majesty. <laughs> Look outside, Fitzwalter. What do you see? Cemetery, Your Majesty? Excellent. Tell the barons that when the cemetery gives back, so also will King John. Thus, merry England in the reign of King John. The hostility and the fear lay like a sleeping thing while John levied assessments and extorted payment from his subjects. Then it came about that Hubert, the Archbishop of Canterbury, died, and the monks disputed the bishops as to his successor. The candidates of the rival factions went before the Pope, and Innocent III, being an astute man, ruled for neither, but named Stephen Langton instead. And King John grew mightily incensed. I do not meddle in the affairs of Rome. Let Rome not meddle in the affairs of England. Pembroke. Yes, Your Majesty. Do you know this Langton? Know him, sire? No, except that he is a cardinal of the church and the new archbishop of Canterbury. Perhaps a cardinal in Rome, but not an archbishop in Canterbury. Pembroke, my orders. Yes, sire. Langton is refused admission to England. Am I understood? Very well, sire. Good. Now, 
We shall teach his holiness that John will bear no trifling. Pembroke, order your men to seize church property throughout London. At once, Pembroke. Pembroke! Pembroke! Coming, your majesty. Does he think to frighten me? I am John of England. I'm the king. I beg your pardon, sire. I do not know... Oh, be still, you fool. The Pope has placed England under an interdict. I see through it, Pembroke. He seeks to turn the people against me. It won't work, do you hear? It won't work. Friar, admit us to the church. No. The doors of the churches of England are closed. It is the interdict. What are you waiting for, woman? For the bells, Friar. No church bells ring in England, woman. It is the interdict. Confess a dying old man of his sins, Father. I cannot. The last sacrament is forbidden under the interdict. <laughs> he is dead. Oh, Friar, there was none to shrive him. Let him at least be buried in consecrated ground. I cannot help you. My heart bleeds for you, but I cannot help you. It is forbidden by the interdict. This is your doing, John. Sarah, I am your king. You know how to address a king. Yes, your majesty. I know how to address a king. I have no liking for your tone, Fitzwalter. Will you quibble with me, sire, at a time when the church is withdrawn from the kingdom? I ask you, Fitzwalter, where is your loyalty? To the Pope or to your king? All England ponders that question, Your Majesty. Answer, you traitor. It is for you to answer, Your Majesty. Do you want my answer? Yes. Very well. Since you seem to be concerned for the church... I give you leave to inform the Pope of Rome that the lands of the bishops are hereby declared forfeit. You do not know what you are saying, sire. Don't I? The emissaries of His Holiness are on their way with messages. Tell them to turn back. Your Majesty. To turn back, Fitzwater. For if they set foot in this palace on my honor as a Christian, I shall have their eyes torn from their heads. <laughs> In the year 1209, Innocent III declared King John excommunicated. At once, the men of Wales rose in rebellion, and John summoned his barons to go to war. And many barons refused. You are their leader, Fitzwalter. You have no proof of that, sire. Good for you that I do not. Your head would be in the executioner's basket. I do not doubt you, sire. Leader or no leader, Fitzwalter, inform my barons that those who stay at home must remain loyal. And I shall take measures to assure their loyalty. My Lord Pembroke. You called, sire. Go among our good barons, my lord, and take from each a child. For what purpose, your majesty? I speak to Pembroke, sir, not to you. But since you ask, Fitzwalter, I shall tell you. The children shall be my hostages. But your majesty... You think I am without wit, Fitzwalter. I know how to command loyalty. Yes, the barons will be loyal. Even to an excommunicated king. You shall have none of my children, John. I see. Your husband trembles at the knee, and so he sends his lady, Matilda. Well, Matilda, return to your castle and order your husband here. No, John. I do not return. And you take no child of mine as hostage. And pray, why not? Because once you took your own nephew, Arthur, as hostage, and you killed him with your own murderous hand. God, Caesar! Will you murder me also? No, Matilda. I am a gentleman... You will murder yourself, yes. Take her to the dungeon guards, and the first man who gives her water to drink or bread to eat will answer to me. Would you? Would you starve me, John? Come, Matilda. You will starve quite well by yourself. Quite so. Drink your own tears and feed on your own fat. Take her away. <laughs> It is not the pain, but the cause which makes martyrs. And perhaps somewhere in England, there is a monument to the Lady Matilda de Brose, who died a martyr's death. And also perhaps to Geoffrey, Archdeacon of Westminster, 
who suffered a leaden collar to be tightened around his neck because he would permit no priest to accompany the armies of an excommunicated and evil king. There were many martyrs in England. Some were hanged and some were suffocated and some were starved. And whether through fear of God or because he learned that Innocent III had authorized the King of France to lead a holy crusade against England, John yielded to the Pope and met with the papal legate to Dover. Do you, John, submit to his holiness and do him homage? Why do you think I summoned you, you fool? Do you, John, or do you not? Very well, I do. Do you accept Stephen Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury? Call Philip of France off and I'll accept the devil himself. Do you, John, or do you not? I do, I do, I do. Be quick, man, be quick. Do you promise to make full restitution to the church and to the bishops, monks, clerks, and all those at the church whom you have wrongfully deprived of property and rights? Oh, what a dull, dull fellow, my lords. I do, man. You seem to show no contrition, my son. Contrition is your business, not mine. Now send this accursed Stephen Langton to me and let's be done with the mummery. So you're Langton. Sire, I am the Archbishop of Canterbury. Good. I'm the King of England. Remember that. I'm instructed, sire, to lift the sentence of excommunication. Fine. It's just in time. In time, Your Majesty? To be candid, I have found it a slight inconvenience. I dare say, Your Majesty. I think I like you, Langton. I'll tell you something. There are some grudges I do not forget. No, no, not you. Philip. Philip Augustus of France. Him I do not forget. And he will not soon forget me. I prepare for war, Archbishop. War for the glory of England. Now, uh, good day, sir. Our war chests are somewhat depleted. We must take steps to replenish them. Be silent, gentlemen. Thank you, sirs. Which of you is Giles the barber? I, sir. I am he. Excellent. Do you pull teeth, Giles? As quick as any barber in England, sir. Never mind that. Can you pull teeth slowly, eh? Slowly, sir? Very slowly, Giles. Uh, can you break a tooth in the socket? Oh, it happens sometimes, sir. But it's not a good thing. For my needs, it is a sovereign good. There are some usurers in Bristol who say they have no money. Pull their teeth, Giles. Slow, sir. Exactly. One tooth each day until they yield their money. Suppose I pull all their teeth and they have no money. No doubt they will be dead by then. The barons are not bound to serve you abroad, sire. Speak for yourself, Fitzwalter. Gladly. My knights and I do not follow you to France. And if you try to compel us, sire... Finish, my good Fitzwalter. You were about to say if I tried to compel you, I should first have to fight a war at home. Yes. For decent men, there is no comfort, no counsel, no consolation, except in resistance to you. I think I dislike you less when you do not make speeches. It is no idle speech, Your Majesty. You're a dull fellow, Fitzwalter. It will be a pleasure to kill you someday. But not now, Your Majesty. No, not now. First, I have a score to settle with the King of France. Your turn will come later, Fitzwalter. Archbishop, there are some in England who wish to know whether they can count on you. And you among the some, Fitzwalter? I among them, Archbishop. I am a servant of the church, sir. Rebellion is not for the church. I am sworn to uphold John. John fights an evil war in France. Do you also uphold that? Do you ask me to be disloyal to my country? I am an Englishman. In times like this, Archbishop, the best Englishman is one who speaks against his king. Are you with us, sir? I cannot be with you, Fitzwalter. Wait. No, I cannot be with you. But I will not be against you.
the pattern shapes. John and France fighting in a doomed cause. The nobles, the middle class, and the church at home waiting for him to fail. And in France, King John failed and signed the humiliating peace of September 18th, 1214. And John and his bedraggled armies returned to England. And instead of showing a face of humility, John spoke arrogantly. Fitzwalter, I demand a tax from you. Indeed, sire. From you and from every baron who did not follow me to France. Do you force the issue, sire? Force? Exactly, Fitzwalter. The word is force. I shall communicate your wish to the baron, sire. Demand is a better word, Fitzwalter. Yes, your majesty. Demand is a better word. In solemn convocation on November 20th, 1214, the barons of England met with Robert Fitzwalter and Stephen Langton, Archbishop of Canterbury. They spoke of their common humiliation and of the corruption that beset the land. They spoke warily and with fear of John, and some counseled moderation. No, I say no. You cannot resist moderately. For he will not compel you moderately. You counsel rebellion, Fitzwalter. Yes, my lord. I'm not afraid of the word. I am. If we resist the king, our peasants in time will resist us. They will, my lord, if you give them cause for resistance. And it will not be such a bad thing. Come, come, Fitzwalter. You don't mean that. Why not? You betray your class, sir. You do. If your peasants resist you for sir, good cause. My lords, let us not find disagreement among ourselves. The king is treacherous and a tyrant. We serve him well by our divisions. If you wish liberty from tyranny, show John the point of your daggers. Do you also counsel rebellion, Archbishop Langton? I counsel justice, my lord. I see. That Walter would show the point of his dagger, and the archbishop would show the point of his scriptures. <laughs> the two go well together, my lord. Very well. I say fight. Yes. 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 The king will surely resist. What shall we do then? Force him to comply. Will you take an oath on it? To wage war against the king of England if he refuses our conditions? Yes. yes. Fight. 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 And what say you, archbishop? God bless you, gentlemen. It is a good day and a good deed. Langton. Do you address me, sire? I address you, Archbishop. Your Majesty. Excommunicate them. Who, sire? The rebels. I know no rebels, Your Majesty. You lie. You are contumacious, sir. Excommunicate them, I say. It is our order. I refuse, Your Majesty. How dare you, sir? I dare many things, Your Majesty. Even to threaten you with excommunication. I'll have you broken. Save your breath, sir. There is nothing you can do but sign the charter. I'll see them rot first. You will sign, Your Majesty. May God blaspheme your name, Stephen Langton. I marvel that one man can be so wicked. It's war they want, war they'll have. How will Your Majesty wage war? Who stands allied to John? My loyal subjects. There are none left. My nobles. They march against your castles even now. My people. They would see you die like an animal in a ditch and raise no finger to help you. My nobles, I say. There are still some who are not rebels. Who? Which, sire? My, my Lord Pembroke. Who else, sire? Name them. Name your loyal nobles. The name should come ready to your lips. Get out of my sight. Church, people, nobles. All stand against John of England. Get out of my sight, you traitor! But you will sign. Get out, I say! But you will sign. The devil write your filthy tongue! Yes, I... I will sign, I will sign. Now get out! In the year of our Lord, 1215, on the 15th day of June, King John of England stood humbly on the south side of the Thames and faced Stephen Langton and the nobles of the realm standing in the marshy flat before. John, 
by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine, and Earl of Anjou, to the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons, justices, reeds, and John was humble and also bitter. They have given me 25 over kings, he said, and he cursed Stephen Langton and Robert Fitzwalter, but he put his seal of beeswax to the charter. This is the seed of liberty, the seed of English freedom, and the American Bill of Rights. Yet if you look closely into the charter, you will find no word of trial by jury, no single reference to the basic right of habeas corpus. And yet there was much within the 62 provisions of the Charter, which stands for today. The Church is to be free and to hold its rights entire and its liberties uninjured. No freeman shall be taken or imprisoned or dispossessed or outlawed or banished or in any way destroyed. Nor will we go upon him, nor send upon him, except by legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. In short, a government of laws and not of men. Yes, there is much in Magna Carta which was not new even in the year 1215 and much that was feudal and unprogressive. Yet Magna Carta is a tradition, a legend. Sometimes a legend can be more sovereign than a fact. I shall say it in another way. Magna Carta is, by misinterpretation, the pillar of our freedom, the shield of our liberties, and the way we came. Thanks, bud. I'm glad they gave him the works. He didn't sign it, soldier. But he put his seal to it. A seal of beeswax as big as a saucer. <clears throat> now, uh, let me tell you about the Magna Carta of the plumbing industry. Section 26 of the code. Whereas in pursuant of Section 24, Clause 1, Subsection 3, G, Article 2A, all drains, sewers, cesspools... That's and... very nice, soldier. Well, I ain't even begun. I get the point, though. All sorts of people have Magna Cartas. Workers, businessmen, women, children. Everybody has, soldier. I guess so. Doggone, it sure got around, didn't it? Yes, soldier. It sure got around. NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter One of the new historical series, We Came This Way. Next week, We Came This Way will present a story of a feudal revolution in the 14th century. A handbook containing background information with suggestions for further reading is now in publication. We shall be happy to send you, at cost, this valuable We Came This Way handbook, especially written for the current series. Send 25 cents to cover the cost of printing and mailing to... We came this way, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. This program is presented by the NBC University of the Air, not only for the listeners in this country, but also for our servicemen and women overseas to be transmitted to them wherever they are stationed through the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight's script was written by Morton Wishingrad and directed by Ira Avery. The music was conducted by Milton Katims. Members of the cast were Gilbert Mack, Bartlett Robinson, Cecil Roy, Humphrey Davis, Joe DeSantis, Louis Van Ruten, John Merlin, and Lon Clark. The narrator was John W. Vandercook. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm -hmm.